ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the esteemed FaceTime with Leaders, an initiative by World Development Corporation. I am Falaseed Khan, anchor at World Development Corporation. FaceTime with Leaders is a platform for industry titans to share their experiences, thoughts, ideas, and best practices in order to inspire one another and future leaders. In a nutshell, we attempt to encapsulate the multi-decadal learnings acquired by these industry leaders. We also hope that by conducting these FaceTime with Leaders interviews, we can bring together a global community of eminent personalities. By bringing together such visionaries on one platform, we hope to play a part in inspiring the lives of other leaders. Great learnings from great leaders undoubtedly assist everyone by identifying nurturing and using the trade secrets that are proven success formulas for many. And this is what we aim for with these sessions by making them a gathering of industry stalwarts and a knowledge sharing community. We have one such industry titan on FaceTime with leaders with us today, Mr. Himanshu M. Vyas. Hello, welcome Mr. Vyas. We are glad to have you here today with us on FaceTime with leaders. Very nice to connect with you, Falak. And I am really thankful that you have invited me on, on this platform. And my greetings to all the viewers. I hope this uh, interaction with Falak will provide a lot of insights to all of you. And we'll all learn together something new from these discussions. Definitely, definitely. We are glad to have you here today with us too. So let me give you a quick brief about Mr. Vyas. He is the founder and chief consultant of HMV Business Consulting, a highly accomplished and result-driven business consultant with a successful track record spanning two decades. He is known for his creative, passionate, and dynamic approach to business strategy formulation and deployment, resulting in sustainable growth, increased top line and bottom line, and enhanced business performance. So, Mr. Vyas, could you let our viewers know about your career journey maturing in the form of HMV Business Consulting? Yeah, sure. So, you know, uh, nost I'm, I'm a bit nostalgic today while I'm discussing this with you because it leads me back to 1997 when I uh, was there as a management trainee with Amul and I was placed at Amul's head office in Anand. And then you know, Amul is the largest company in India, one of the largest yes. corporations in India. And I was very, very fortunate to start my career with Amul. That's really great. So when I was there in Amul, I was in product management group. That is called PMG. In those days, it was called PMG. And you know what? My career as business consultant started taking shape from there itself. At that time, I was not knowing that my career is shaping towards business consulting. During my tenure in Amul, I learned business strategies. You know, at initial stage of your career, business strategies to learn business strategies is a big boon in itself. Because you can learn sales, distribution, marketing strategies, but business strategies is totally different ballgame altogether. So I was very fortunate to learn business strategies during my stint with Amul. And and another thing which had happened over there at that time was Amul had hired Tata Consultancy Services and Aisha Consultancy Services to enhance their business potential, enhance their market uh, potential, and to improve their top line and bottom line, and also the internal processes. So I learned a lot from there. At that time, in 1997, we had made a plan, a business plan of 10,000 crores, 100 billion Indian rupees that we wanted to achieve by 2005. People used to laugh at us. Oh my God, in 1997, you're talking about 10,000 crores of business in milk when there is no cold chain available in India. You guys have gone mad. <laughs> But the business goals, we don't say targets. We say business goals we had set for ourselves. We said we'll achieve it. Right. And you'd be surprised to know in 2000, 2005, I had a lot of friends in Amul. By, by 2005, Amul achieved 7,000 crores. Way, uh, 3,000 crores below that 10,000 mark. But 7,000 crores is not a small number at all. From 1,200 yeah. crores to 7,000 crores. So that business the strategy planning, which was there, was very good. The methodology which I learned from Amul was... I mean, hats off to the leadership over there. 
who handled us. I was uh, just an um, executive over there at the level of executive, but I learned. It was a good learning experience. So I, I was also exposed to the national market. I was handling three products over there, Amul Chocolates, Amul Ghee, and Sagar Ghee. So I was exposed to the national market, the sales distribution part of it, the marketing, the BTL, the ATL, the brand communication, that part also is exposed to, right? So there's a very good exposure I had of his level. Now, one fine morning, I thought, okay, at the grassroots level also, one should get some exposure. So I shifted my career to sales and distribution, pure sales, hardcore sales. And I, I got a job, I, I, I shifted to Goodlass Naralik Paints as a depot manager. Depot manager in Jabalpur, and I was handling whole Ma Kaushal Belt. Ma Kaushal Belt is on one side, there is a Maharashtra border, other side, there is UP border. And the entire belt I used to handle, we used to handle, our team used to handle from Jabalpur, okay? And we had a huge depot over there. And we used to handle 132 uh, dealers and a lot of other sub-dealers. And we used to do sales and we used to do a lot of activities and we had painters at that time. And I will give you one more uh, uh, you know, information. At that time, we used to do this blockchain in our own way. You will be surprised how. Because we used to send material from our depot to smaller locations. Now, at that time, we used to cross uh, that particular material at various points because there was no direct transportation available to remote location. So we used to telephone whether they were received or not, or they used to telephone us, the material is received. Now we are giving it to some other uh, uh, transporter. So that is the, that is how we used to manage that uh, supply chain at that time. So that is a very good exposure to distribution, sales, you know, at a grassroots level. Now what happened? In 2004, I saw an opportunity. I saw an opportunity in the finance sector, the burgeoning finance sector, right? Because the Indian economy was opening, the, the, the insurance sector, the banking sector was opening, and I got a very good break in ICICI Bank. So I shifted to ICICI Bank and I was there with ICICI Bank and HDFC Bank for almost eight years. I really enjoyed eight to nine years with the banking industry in various roles. I was there in various roles in, in the banking industry. I was there in wealth management. I was in personal banking. I was in branch banking. And I really enjoyed working in the banking sector as well. So if you see overall, I started with the business strategy. I was there in Amul, I was there in sales. I was there for marketing. I had experience in marketing uh, as well as ATL, BTL. Then I was into sales distribution of hardcore, you know, at the grassroots level. Then I was in the banking sector, the finance sector. So that gave, gave me a lot of exposure to SMEs because as a branch head of a 350 crore branch, I had to, had in, I had to have interaction with a lot of SME owners. So that really helped me to understand their problems. You know, they uh, uh, they had uh, the requirement of loans. We used to go and uh, meet them, and we used to understand the potential of their business. We used to understand where the you know why banks. What what is the what is how the banks would uh, evaluate a proposal. We saw, we saw from that side and they used to give the, their perspective. So that was like, you know, we used to have that discussion with them. So they, it, it gave me very good perspective on their SME as well as large corporates. How do they function? What are their problems? What are the challenges? And what potential are they going to achieve in future? So that was a very good exposure. And then, then in 2011, I started my own business consulting company. I had this dream when I was working with Damul. I saw this ISA consultancy services and Tata consultancy, Tata consultancy services. And I had this dream in mind that one day I will launch my own business consulting company. So I launched my business consulting company in 2011. Okay. And I had uh, two projects. Before I uh, resigned, I had already two projects in, on my plate, right? That's so I started my business from there and uh, I then slowly and gradually uh, we are there now into business consulting since uh, uh, 2011. So it's almost 12 years plus now and we have been uh, able to successfully uh, implement our business consulting methodologies in various 
sectors like dairy, like FMCG or packed foods, like laminates, like furniture, then woven sex industry, where the uh, that particular material is used for packaging and uh, fertilizers, as well as uh, 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 this, uh, you know, big bags for exports and all on this uh, uh, usage that woven sex industry, the, the material is being used. So we have been successfully implementing this strategy across various industries. The methodology which I learned in uh, Amul and which I have upgraded during the last 12 years, we have successfully implemented across various industries and in various clients. That's really very interesting and very wonderful to know your career journey. I'm sure like, you know, you've like just grown over the years and it's really <laughs> good to know that. So uh, I want to know, like, what were the biggest challenges that you have faced in your entrepreneurial journey and how did you overcome them? Well, you know, uh, entrepreneurial journey, uh, as you know, initial two years, three years are always difficult. However confident you are, how many contacts you have, the networks you have, but to convert that network into business is a different ballgame altogether. Right. Right. So as I told you, I didn't hang up my boots just like that. I had two projects on my hand. And after that, I hang up, hang up my boots and I had a good network also. So I knew I can fall back upon that network and get some very good projects. But having said that, uh, I had to administer my business consulting methodologies in the organization, make it successful, win the trust confidence of the entrepreneur, win, win the trust and confidence of the company and go to the second level. That was my challenge, right? My challenge was not to get projects. I could get projects because of my context, because I was there in the market for a very, very long time. I was there in the banking industry for eight, 10 years. I was there with Amul. I was there with Gurla Saralek Paint. So I had a lot of context in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the field. So the first challenge I overcome within two or three years. To overcome this particular challenge, you know, I did a lot of networking initially. I did a lot of discussions. I did a lot of presentations, like what exactly this business consulting is all about. I had to differentiate between a motivational speaker, um, a business coach, Today, the coaching is also a different segment altogether, a trainer and a business consultant. So these four different aspects are there. So I had to differentiate myself in the market saying that we are business consultants. We are not the other three uh, things. We are not the other three people. So I was able to successfully differentiate myself before the companies. I was able to convince them through my networking and my presentation skills. Okay, I'll be able to bring some value to the table. And people gave me first break. A lot of companies gave me break. My first break was, uh, big break was with, say, uh, Shadar Decor Private Limited. It's among the top 10 uh, laminates company in India. So within 12 years, we were able to work with such big companies, good, reputed brands. Then another break was with Mahi Milk Producer Company. The, the top line of that particular company was 475 crores. Wow. Yeah. Then another break which we got within four or five years was this Ananda Dairy. Ananda Dairy is a, a, a brand based in Delhi and it is having a top line. At that time, it was having a top line of 700 crores. So we had, fortunately, we were able to get good projects. And fortunately, even more fortunately, we were able to administer our business consulting methodology successfully in this particular organizations. I'll give an example. Mahi Milk Producer Company won the fastest growing dairy company in Western India. And the CEO, Mr. Harsad Joshi and myself, we went to Singapore to collect uh, the award of fastest growing dairy company in Western India. So that was a success that we got within three and a half years. The top line of uh, Shadar Decor was 70 CR and we were able to successfully we last 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 year we closed at 250 CR from one facility. Now now they are in two or three facilities, and I'm really thankful to Mr. Vishal Dukanya 
the managing director of the company to give me an opportunity. So Mr. Arshad Joshi of my milk producer company, Vishal Dukanya of Shedar Decor, then uh, Somesh Dukanya of Durian Industries, then Keur Virani of Balaji Wafers, and last but not the least uh, in, in Singapore. So Mr. Arshad Joshi and myself, we went to Singapore, we collected the award. Uh, so I'm really, uh, thankful to all the business leaders who provided this particular opportunity to uh, administer a business consulting methodology successfully, through which they also uh, sort of benefited a lot. And we also grew our business, right? So uh, the business leaders were like uh, Mr. Vishal Dukani of Shedar Decor, then Mr. Sumesh Dukani of Durian Industries, uh, Mr. Uh, Keur Virani of Balaji Wafers, as I told you, Mr. Arsad Joshi of my milk producer company. First while he was managing director, now he has resigned from there. And last but not the least, respectable and very good business leader, Mr. Kamal Agrawalji of Haldirams. So they, they are the people who have really uh, provided us the opportunity. And we have been able to make a lot of impact in their business. And we are also grown uh, together. So this is uh, how we have been able to over That's really, yeah. So what success mantra would you like to share with our viewers who are future leaders in the corporate world? Oh, well, um, uh, very good question. Actually, I have been following quite a few things, but five things are very, very important for me. Very, very important, you know. First and foremost uh, is identify your skills. Right, We have to identify our skills. If we think we are good at something, we should be happy in doing it. It is not just that I am good at doing something, but it is like, you know, okay, I am not so, I'm just doing it for the sake of, I'm good, but I'm doing it for the sake of, not that. Skills is something which I am doing it and I'm happy doing it. Right. So that is the first thing I should have or one should have. Second, most important, another, is what capabilities do I have? I need to identify that. See, there is a difference between skill and capability. The skill is the talent which we have. The capability is the behavioral part with the skill. Like say, a company has a skill of uh, manufacturing good laminates. The capability is to manufacture 10,000 laminates in one batch or whatever. So that is a capability we are talking about. A particular person has a skill of running. The capability will be a marathon or maybe in a shorter version. So what capabilities do we have? What skills we have? What capabilities we, we have? Both these things we have to identify. Third, what is my life motto? I should have a life motto. That will be a compass which will be guiding continuously. Like I will give an example. I will give an example. At HME Business Consulting, we have a life motto or a business consulting motto, strategize and sustain growth. Whatever, whatever projects we take up for luck, whatever projects we take up, we have this motto in our mind. We have to strategize, not only strategize, but we also have to sustain that growth. That means we don't have to take shortcuts. That means we don't have to go beyond the corporate governance, beyond the interests of internal and external customers. So that is the third thing. First, skills. Identify your skills. Second, identify your capabilities. Third, identify your life motto. Fourth, evolve a set of values. You may have, we may have skills, we may have capabilities, we may have motto, but values are, <laughs> it's all useless, right? We have seen that. We have seen that in so many corporations like Enron or Yes Bank or ICICI or so many examples are there before us. Didn't people have skills? People had skills. People had capabilities. People had motto. People had vision, mission. 
values values were missing missing completely so we need to have that strong value foundation over which we build all these things you know the big structure then you can build you know burj khalifa over there you know so that burj khalifa can be like it can be a huge uh, monument on which you build this you know on the on the foundation of your values and last fifth point fifth point always have a vision of best version of yourself before you what i want to be in next 3 years or 5 years 5 years is too long these days 3 years is new 5 years these days because fast changing environment fast changing technology everything is so fast so within next 3 years what i what is the best version of myself so these are the five mottos five uh, important mantras which i always uh, which are close to my heart what are my skills what are my capabilities what are my uh, you know what is my motto what are my uh, values and what is the best version of myself five things that's that really very really wonderful <laughs> Yes, I'm sure. Like you know, everyone watching this, they should also follow to be like you know, like at least in terms of successful as you are. So when we talk about corporate governance, what led to the development of your interest in corporate governance? Oh yes, that's a very good, uh, very pertinent question actually. So uh, see, our motto, as I told you, is strategize and sustain growth. So. have you seen or has anybody seen sustainability without proper governance it can't be possible it can't be possible there there will be lot of hiccups right we have seen lot of examples in which there was a lack of corporate governance and because of which there was no sustainability so this particular century is about fifth revolution which we are talking about and it is about sustainability we want to have sustainable growth through technological help through environment protection through proper corporate governance governance internal as well as external you know justice to the internal as well as external external customers so sustainability we can never have without corporate governance this is what i have learned in so many years i was there in the banking industry of alag and in banking industry you know there are so many rbi guidelines that a branch has to follow and we have audit parameters we have auditors coming to our branch we have surprise audits we have cluster head audits we have zonal head audits we do our self audits we follow we we used to follow so many different different parameters so we, we we knew the importance of all these things and supposing we miss something out then the risk of the staff is there risk of the customers money is there the risk to the reputation is there and the risk to you know the 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 mental uh Uh, health of so many people is there i knew one particular person who was who was really stuck up in this because of non uh, compliance to audit in one of the branches and the kind of uh, uh, problems he was facing of mental health i could i am able to recall when you are asking me this question so corporate governance is not a small thing corporate governance is such a big thing that it affects the individual it affects the society it affects the reputation it affects strategy it affects business it affects the top line it affects the bottom line everything it affects and so from the very beginning at hmb business consulting we have this in our mind and we have this in our motto engraved in our motto strategize and sustain growth that's the reason why this corporate governance is logical extension to our career it is not just out of the blue that we have decided to 
get ourselves involved in this particular sector. No. And we like this challenge. Now what happens? <laughs> I tell you, what happens? Everybody gets tempted. You're sitting in and doing business, everybody gets tempted. Let's make more money. Let's increase the bottom line. Instead of 25% uh, CAGR, let's go to 35%. Let's go to 40%. Who doesn't get tempted? And this is big money involved, you know, big business, big money involved. So as business consultants, we really like this challenge, how to overcome this temptation and still have growth with corporate governance. You know, last year, how many new corporate governance laws have been published by government of India, which all the companies have to comply? You'll be surprised by the number. It's a huge number. So, but still the companies have to do it. A lot of companies have to do it and still they have to uh, strategize and they have to sustain the growth. And we as business consultants, we would love to take up this challenge. That's really great. So I want to know, like, as someone who is upping his game in the corporate governance space, what values do you offer to the corporate world? Oh, so, <laughs> so there again, you know, when you're talking about corporate governance and when you're talking about the uh, changes which are happening in the external environment and the government rules and regulations are also pressing. So... I think three most important uh, things which I would uh, like to suggest over here is that we should have continuous improvement, continuous improvement, continuous improvement in strategies, continuous improvement in the people skills and continuous improvement in the processes. Three things. The continuous improvement has to be there if you want to have good corporate governance and growth both together. Now, say continuous improvement in strategies is there, but if the continuous improvement people's skills are not there, then the strategy deployment will hamper. Now, if the people's skills are there, but the processes are not there, the advanced technologies are not used to up the processes, or to tie the processes together, you know, then also there will be some problem. So we need to really understand that continuous improvement is a must. Without this continuous improvement, the strategy and the growth and the corporate governance will not happen. And to, re and to remain relevant and for continuous improvement, we have to be alert always. So alertness is what, like, you know, if you are planning for five years, you plan for two years or three years. Don't plan for long these days. Three, two or three years is new five year. If before 10 years or before seven or 10 years, if you are planning, you could have planned for five years, three and a half, four to five years. Now we have to plan for, and every now and then we have to go back to the drawing board. We have to review. We have to have a very good review mechanism if we have to have this continuous improvement. Right? So that is the first thing, continuous improvement. I've elaborated enough on that. Second, most important is commitment to the internal and external customers. Now, we have seen a lot of companies wherein the independent directors or wherein the board of directors were committed to a VIP or a VIP culture or a celebrity culture. There are very few people who could open their mouth and suggest or bring it to the table okay, what is right for the organization, what is right for the health of the organization in the long run. What is good for the internal and external customers? External stakeholders, external customers are very, very important. Same way, the internal customers, including the employees and the laborers are important. 
So there has to be a trade-off. I'm not saying you just fell, fall flat for all of them, but there has to be a practical trade-off how you balance this whole thing without ignoring the, the right things. And with, by bringing it together, by bringing it to the notice of everybody and working in a complementary environment, not in a single person driven environment, in a complementary environment, because we are living in a complementary world. We are not living in a uh, VIP world, you know. In business world is always complementary. All, all, all worlds are complementary. So that commitment to internal and external customer is a must. That's the second thing. Third is the ownership. Third is the ownership. Now, ownership, I'm not talking in terms of possessiveness. Please understand. People, when you say ownership, people become possessive about something. No. Because we all learn that being a director or being an employee of the organization means you're a trustee. You're not the owner. The owner himself is having a stake. Right? He is having a, some stake in the company. And then he is managing the whole business. He is a leader with a complementary team. This is what we have learned. So ownership means doesn't mean possessiveness, but it means output. What output I am supposed to deliver? What am I supposed to bring to the table? What am I supposed to do as a duty? Say, for example, I am there in the audit team. For say, for example, I am in the uh, corporate governance, you know, different, different corporate governance team. I'm there in the strategy building team, maybe. So what is that output that I have to bring? What is the ownership that I take up over there? And how I deliver the output? So three things, as I told you. The first and foremost is uh, the continuous improvement part. The second is a, a commitment to internal and external customers. And third is a ownership. These three are the very, very important things which uh, we need to consider. Indeed, true indeed. I'm sure that like, everyone should follow this. So uh, when we talk about technology, what are some of the most remarkable changes you have seen in your field with changes in technology? And what changes do you expect to see with the advent of IoT, AI, ML, blockchain, big data, and Web 3.0? You know what? We are seeing this impact of technology since we started business consulting. <laughs> in a small or big way, we have been... Uh, uh, having this, uh, I mean, we have been impacted by it. I'll give an example, a very nice example. Like, uh, as I told you, I had a client in woven sex industry, right? So he's very close to Ahmedabad, near Masana. He's having a facility and he has 125 looms. He had, I don't know what, what is the situation today. 125 looms at that time. Now the looms, they manufacture that cloth for, the woven sex, which is used in fertilizer and cement, cement industry, right? Now, that particular uh, 125 looms were of China make, uh, Sarwine make, and Lohia make, these three different brands. And there was this particular facility used to run for three shifts. So, obviously, maintenance issue will be there, continuous, the machines are working. The China looms were making a lot of problems, were creating a lot of hassles. And there were 60 to 70 percent were China looms. So by the time the China loom is, uh, you know, not working, and by the time the maintenance people get uh, information about it, a lot of time is wasted. At least two hours has, has been wasted, two hours, three hours, then you go and repair. So one particular batch, Half of the 50% capacity is utilized for one particular loom. Now multiply it with 10 looms or 5 looms or China make. And that repeated, this thing happens in a month. Then how much production loss is there? So what solution we came out with at that time? Before I'm talking about this before 11 years. Huh? I'm talking this 2012, 2013. We came out with a solution of uh, internet IoT. We put a device over there in each and every loom. And whenever there was a breakdown, whenever the loom stops, there was a buzz, which was there in the production manager's room, as well as in the uh, maintenance manager's room on, the, on, his, on their screen with the loom number. And, and we had that people ready with the kit and all these things, you know, 
and they used to go, they used to repair, they used to fill up a form, and they used to input the data, and we used to analyze that data. And we eliminated the repeated problems very fast. And you won't imagine the kind of production capacity utilization went up within three months. It shot up like anything. So we are facing, we, we are very happy that the technology has helped us to get the grassroots level realities, the ground realities in the real time, which has helped us to build strategies for growth and to be effective in the long and short run. In the long run also, let me, let me give you an example of long run. I give you an example of short run. Three months example I gave you. Let me give an example of long run. We implemented ERP in one of the FMCG companies. Now ERP system, a lot of training is required because a lot of fit on streets are there, distributors are there. Now distributors as such are not very educated people. They have those tempos and they run around and they distribute material on the retail outlets, AB class retail outlets. Now to get real data, okay, which particular retail outlet, A class retail outlet, B class retail outlet, C class retail outlet, D class retail outlet, how much material they are placing, what is the throughput of that particular route? We used to do this route planning also. It was all on paper. Now slowly and gradually we moved to ERP. And with that ERP, we could manage the routes very effectively. Certain routes were weekly, certain routes were bi-weekly. Certain routes had A class retail outlets, which had a different requirement altogether. Certain routes had B class outlets, so more B class outlets, and addition of retail outlets on each route. That also we could monitor. So, all these things really help in the long run because a lot of training required, a lot of follow ups required. It was a head initially, a lot of headache kind of a situation. But then, post that, uh, it has really helped. Uh, the company a lot to improve the top line and efficiency, the effectiveness, the sales efficiency has improved a lot, right? So this is another example which uh, I would I, I can share with you. So so what I feel is like you know there's a big debate going on these days when you switch on TV you know there is a lot of debate going on these days. What is going to happen of machine learning, say for example, of say blockchain, of say yeah. web three point yes. oh. So many, so many big terminologies, and I am not a very technical person, but definitely I can throw some light on it because I've been working as business consultant in different companies. So I've come across this terminology, and I've uh, it has really opened my mind to it. You know what? I have uh, I think that people have to up their skills, people and the organization. They have to up their skills. The new high will be new low. And the high has to go very high. To fully grasp the benefit and to fully stay relevant. Say, for example, if one particular company, one particular company implements blockchain in its supply chain, in its supply chain management, it will disrupt the whole industry. Other companies also has to do it. And the change will be so fast. The change is going to be so fast that, uh, you know, the, the people who don't take up, you know, the change will be left behind in a very big way. So the change is going to be very fast, number one, very, very fast. We have seen the revolutions like coal revolution we saw. We saw gas revolution. We saw nuclear and electronic revolution. We saw this uh, web revolution or internet or web revolution, mobile revolution. So many revolutions we saw. This particular revolution is one of the revolution which you are saying, but this is little bit different because it is very fast, very fast. And most importantly, we as humans, we as human race, I'm being philosophical a bit. We as human race, we face a lot of changes in the environment. Not only that, we also create opportunities and threat for our own self. You know, in Chinese language, they have only one word for opportunity and threats. So I have also termed it as upper threats. So we always have upper threats before us. We also create upper threats before us. And we, we address those upper threats and we feel happy about it. 
So these are upper threats before us. So we have to address it to, with two things. The first is to up the skills. And second is to be fast. These two things we have to do. Then we will be able to uh, do full justice with the, all the technology which is there. Machine learning is not bad. It will not create joblessness. Only thing is the people who are there, the blue collar jobs, data entry operators or you know sm small timer programmers, they will be affected more. But the higher programmers, or I don't think they will be affected. Still, a lot of debates is going on. Let's see what happens in future. So as you know, we are building a community of industry magnets. The move is meant for cross-pollination of knowledge and building a knowledge-sharing community of corporate giants and industry experts. So what are your thoughts about these initiatives taken by Mr. Zishan Pathan, Mr. Hebel Mehta, and the whole World Development Corporation team? So I would really like to thank, first of all, uh, my heart heartfelt uh, gratitude to your whole organization and your whole team to provide us with this platform. Because as I told you, we are living in a complementary world and we really need each other's ideas. We need to share each other's uh, ideas, you know, in, a, in order to stay relevant. And the changes in the environment are so big and so fast, unless and until we don't interact with each other and unless and unless we don't help each other. It's of no use actually. So really, I'm really grateful uh, to your organization to provide us with this particular platform. So my congratulations to the entire team of World Development Corp Corporation uh, to provide uh, so many people like me, so many professionals like me, the opportunity to interact, opportunity to learn, opportunity to provide their ideas, to share their ideas and knowledge and experience. And that I know it will help us all a lot. So really, I'm thankful for that. And congratulations. Well, yeah. Really kind words by you. So it was fantastic conversing with you. And I'm confident that your insights will inspire future leaders. Thank you for joining us today, Mr. Himan Shubhyas. We wish you the best for your future endeavors. Moreover, trust that this initiative by Directors Institute unquestionably expanded the participants' understanding and enriched their minds. Thank you so much once again for joining us today on FaceTime with Leaders and sharing all your wonderful principles, your values that you follow, and your career journey with us. I'm sure like, you know, everyone watching this, it is going to help them grow in their careers too. Thank you, Falak. Thank you for having me. And thank, thank you all the viewers. Who have uh, who are going to listen to our uh, conversation? <laughs> Made Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.